Tee. Hair flip. Yeah, I'm a better bitch. I don't like it. Hair flip. Yeah. Oh my god. So you guys should be happy. Oh my goodness. Hair flip. But anyways, hair flip. And hair flipping on these toes. Hi. everyone and welcome back to your boy Sean Davey Way. Today we will be doing part three on surviving Jay-Z so enjoy. I hope you enjoy. Like and subscribe if you haven't already and I will not hold you any further. Let's get right into surviving Jay-Z part three. We've talked about a lot of important components in Jay-Z's life, and we've also talked about a lot of important people in Jay-Z's life. One of those people we haven't really censored in on has been Dame Dash, and he was very important in Jay-Z's career, especially the beginning, because that's who Jay-Z was with. One of the people was Dame Dash. So let's get into Dame and Jay-Z's hectic relationship. In a marketplace fast-paced as the music industry, there's no shortage of best friends turned sworn enemies. Fueled by ego, investments, or self-preservation, hip-hop has claimed many close bonds. When you share creative headspace with someone, infighting is not only anticipated, but a rather pre-diagnosed part of the process. When it comes to a business partnership, a lapse in a shared outlook can only be sustained for so long. Conjoined by their shared affinity for the hustle, Dame Dash and Jay-Z seem custom-built for prosperity. Flanked by Kareem's Biggs Burke and dressed like cinema's iconic mafiosos, the earlier promotional shots of the two embodied La Familia. There was once a time where Jay and Dame were exactly that. Taking on the record label machine from the ground floor and racking up empathetic wins along the way, launching Jay's seminal debut, Reasonable Doubt, in 1994, Hove admitted to MTV that they had to employ this route because nobody would sign me and Dame was the only one to show faith. Now left estranged since the early 2000s, it's been widely reported that the pair crossed paths a grand total twice within the past 15 years. In Dame's case, the wound continues to fester. Prone to deriding his former stablemate, the past week saw Dame using Jay's controversial deal with the NFL as an indictment of his character. Dame's quote, I mean, everybody knows Jay ain't S-H-I-T. He told Adam 22 on a recent edition of No Jumper. Dame's quote, everyone knows that, listen, if you ask anyone in the industry, it's common knowledge that Jay ain't S-H-I-T. He's about the bag. We all know that. He's self-preserving, period. It's just that the people he does it to don't have Beyonce next to him. They don't have that kind of power. The foundations of the rift between Hove and Dame stem from two deep woven threads. First off, there is a purported culture of his mismanagement and distrust of the top Rockefeller. Perched at the head of the chain of command, there was clear discrepancies in Dame and Jay's vision for the label's future. After renewing their Def Jam contracts for a reported $20 million in 2004, a whole $19.5 million increase of their original 1997 deal, Dame's remark to MTV inferred that he couldn't envision a life without Rockefeller. Dame's quote, All that is paperwork will never break up, he insisted. It's Rockefeller for life. I would never pass the torch to any of my artists. I look at them like family, almost like my children. I would never leave them with anybody else. 
who else could run Rockefeller but me? So quick sidestep. So at this point in time, Jay-Z and Dame Dash, they're super cool. Their business is blossoming from the original deal that they had in 1997, which they signed a $500,000 deal, which I thought was cool because that gave them more financial freedom. Um, taking a deal and taking $500,000 and making millions of dollars after you get that deal, it's easy to pay $500,000 back. You know, signing the major deals is how a lot of artists get messed up because you owe so many people and you don't own a lot of your stuff you know a lot of the music you know that you're making you don't own so it just really just keeps putting you in the hole you know with these big record labels and things like that so back then in the 90s with them signing a five hundred thousand dollar deal because obviously they made millions because their next deal they were offered millions which was in 2004 when they got a 19.5 million dollar increase on their original deal that means that business was great uh jay's first album reasonable doubt it did fine but the next two albums is what made jay a superstar so of course sitting back down with him in 2004 you gotta bring it because he could easily walk because he's not very confined with the original contract so that, that was great for them it's kind of like being independent but with a, a loan being independent with a five hundred thousand dollar loan you know so that gives them way more freedom to do more things so you know shout out to jay-z and dame dash for that but while this was going on when they got that next deal especially in 2004 dame dash started to change he started to party more he started to pay more attention to the rock star celebrity type of lifestyle instead of do what he was supposed to do which the, he was the, the record label holder, like the president, you know, of the company. So there's a lot of paperwork and things that needs to be done. There's a lot of artists that needs to be signed. There's a lot of contracts that need to be written up. There's a lot of checks that need to be cut. And Dame Dash was not doing that. What he was doing was partying. We wanted to be in all Jay-Z's videos, being cameo wherever Jay-Z was. It was just, everything was about him. It was like Jay-Z was his little like show dog or his trophy wife, you know, if you will. So he was really leached on to Jay-Z and all the money was coming in because of Jay-Z, you know, not because of Dame. People weren't showing up to these concerts in the name of Dame Dash. They were showing up for Jay-Z. The records that were being sold were being sold because of Jay-Z. He was the biggest artist on the record label. That's why he owned half the label. So Dame started to move real funny and wasn't starting to act, you know, like a businessman. He was extremely cocky, yelling at people, firing people, and making a lot of business decisions without Jay-Z. Jay-Z. And I do feel like it was shade when he originally said, I would never pass the torch to any of my artists, you know, who can run Rockefeller better than me when you're not running the company at all. Well, you're running it into the ground. And Jay-Z was more so of the business savvy. He was what Dame should have been doing. Jay was professional. Jay was in all of the meetings. Jay never missed a concert and all of that. But he could have been wilding out like Dame Dash and just spending money like crazy. But Jay-Z wasn't doing that. He was moving like a businessman. So let's keep going and figuring out what actually happened in Jay-Z and Dame Dash's relationship. But within six months, Hove opted to assume the position of Def Jam president after the remaining 50% stake of the company was sold to their parent group. But in truth, the wheels had begun to uncouple a long time back in 2002. During a vacation in the Mediterranean islands, any tranquility that Jay was experiencing would soon be disrupted by the corrupt restructuring that Dame was laying out in his absence. Holding a court at a media event, Dame appointed Dipset's Cameron and state property ringleader, Benny Siegel, as the new vice president of the label. So here's what happened. Def Jam bought Rockefeller, okay? And when they bought Rockefeller, they appointed Jay-Z the president of Def Jam. So at this point in time, Jay-Z just became Dame Dash's boss. Dame Dash hates bosses. He's always said that in interviews, like, can't nobody be my boss. You sound soft calling somebody boss. It's like, you, you might as well be calling him daddy, you know, if you're going to call somebody your boss. So he doesn't, he don't do well with, you know, people being over him. And at that point in time, you know, Dame was the CEO of Rockefeller and Jay-Z was the president. So now that 
you know, his status is changing, meaning that now the label that bought our label is making Jay-Z the president, you know, of the label. Of course, that's going to make Dame Dash feel like Jay-Z just sunned me. And Jay-Z didn't talk to Dame about, you know, selling his proportion, uh, you know, to the company. And on top of that, it's like slapping Dame in the face because it's like not only did you sell your stake of it, you're also the president of the people that bought us. Like, oh, no. Nah. So, of course, Dame was feeling some type of way. So, while Jay-Z was on vacation in the Mediterranean Islands, Dash had held a basically a media event letting everybody know that Dipset's Cameron and that state properties, uh, Benny Siegel, would be the new vice president of you know, Rockefeller Records. And Jay-Z was just like, what? You know, like, because he's doing this behind Jay-Z's back. Now, what Jay-Z did, uh, a little underhanded, but not necessarily, because he has the right to sell whenever he wants to sell, and he has the right to take a job position whenever he wants to take a job position. He doesn't need Dame's permission to do any of those things. But it probably would have been nice if Jay-Z would have said something, you know, to Dame prior but other people were trying to tell dame dash like other people in you know the uh state property like um and and dip said they were trying to tell him but he just wouldn't listen you know they're like look jay-z about to jump ship you know whatnot and he's just like no 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 but it ended up happening so dash tried to go behind jay's back and you know make the whole label change up all titles and roles and all of that. And he needed Jay-Z's permission to do so. Like he couldn't do it without Jay's permission, but he still tried. So that was, you know, a power struggle, you know, and he was definitely letting everybody know that he was not going out without a fight. So let's keep going. Scrambling to quell the fallout, Jay spoke from across the Atlantic to the source. Jay's quote, that's not taking effect as of yet. I think the talk is a little premature as of right now. The catalyst for an even more acrimonious falling out between Killer Cam and Hove, it was becoming increasingly clear that the two were singing from different hymn sheets. At best laid plans to continue to go awry, including schematics for a Harlem amusement park and a dramatized account of Jay and Dame's relationship in the scrapped Rockefeller The Movie. Dame saw the writing on the wall and began to batten down the hatches quick sidestep so jay-z spoke from you know uh in the mediterranean and was like look yeah that's not happening um n none of that is going on that's a little you know premature you know maybe something that they you know maybe taking place in the future but as of right now none of that's going on neither one of them are the vice presidents you know don't basically don't listen to <laughs> dame dash because that could be the furthest thing from the truth but at that time, it was also being rumored that Jay-Z and Cameron did not get along, that their relationship was bad, that they did not like one another. And, you know, with Jay-Z coming forward, stating that Cameron especially is not going to be one of Rockefeller's vice presidents, that was just adding fuel to the fire. You know, that was just making people definitely think like, oh, well, of course you don't want Cameron to be a vice president. You don't like him. But Jay was trying to make it seem as if, you know, I don't have a problem with him. But clearly he did. So um, the Harlem Amusement Park that Damon Dash was trying to build and, you know, the movies that he would do, Jay-Z didn't want anything to do with it. Jay-Z didn't want anything to do with the Harlem Amusement Park. He didn't want to be in none of Dame's movies, although Dame kept forcing Jay-Z to do cameos and these horribly written movies. I mean, let's just keep it real. All of the movies were horrible. State Property was okay. I mean, for like when a hood flick, it was okay. But everything else was absolute trash. And you know, even the they had Mariah Carey cameo in one of the movies and the, it still sucked, you know, like nobody cared. And Jay-Z cameoed in that same movie. So Jay didn't want any part of acting. He he never wanted to do anything like that. But um, so when you see Jay in those movies, it's a different outlook now because Jay didn't want to be there. You know, we're, we're thinking that he was in support and he really was not. So he was being forced to be in these movies because he was looking out for Dame. He didn't want to make him feel that he wasn't supportive. So, which he wasn't because he wanted nothing to do with it. But um, moving right along. In a 2008 profile for NY Mag, Dash spoke of his contingency plan. The sole concession he asked from Jay. At a certain point, I got ready to depend on my other artists, he recalls. I started putting an army together. Kanye, Cameron, Beanie, and the diplomats. I figured Jay gave me time to prepare. During a dinner at an upmarket New York restaurant, 
Dame said they had a frank discussion about the future. His quote, go ahead and take the money and the job, but don't take the name. Don't take Rockefeller with you. Dash recalls, I didn't say please, but I might as well have. Here's the thing, Dash. If you're going to say please, you would have said please. You knew at this point in time that Jay basically had you by the throat. You know, Jay could have changed everything. He could have changed the name, took the name, took the, he, everything. He could have just destroyed your life. He could have took all of those artists from you. Basically, Jay could have fired Dame if he wanted to. But Jay didn't do that. You know, he did not. And also, Jay didn't owe Dash anything. Like, any payment that Dash was due, Jay paid. You know, so it's like, dude, I don't owe you anything anymore. The business dealings are bad. You're overly cocky. Like, you run the world. Like, you run me. You you don't. Like, it's like, dude, humble yourself. And even still to this day, Dame has not humbled himself. He still feels like people owe him things, and they don't. You were a bad businessman. You were worried about sex and money. And, and power and you got those things and as quickly as they came as quickly as they left Jay-Z did not do that and I have to give it to him Jay-Z stayed on the business front he worried about his income later he worried about taking care of his family and all of that stuff later he was worried about the long run Dame was worried about within that moment he was worried about the now instead of the later Jay-Z has always been worried about the later once earmarked to be VP, Beanie Siegel had a front row seat to the death of the dynasty. Speaking to Global Grind TV, he believes the tide turned when Dame got too accustomed to the high rolling lifestyle. From conversations I had with Jay when Dame started being famous, he fell victim to the camera, Beanie said. I think if Dame would have played the role as Kareem's Biggs did and handled the business correctly, maybe Rockefeller would still be the force it was. Team with Dash's decision to go on a lot of trips with company money and robbing Peter to pay Paul, the Broad Street bully was also acknowledged that Hove had grown beyond the confines of this battle-tested partnership. See, there you go. I mean, you have other people from the label. You know, even Benny Siegel, the person that was marked to be VP, is even stating himself that, look, if he wouldn't have got so accustomed to this high rolling, high roller type of lifestyle and actually handled the business instead of worried about being in front of the camera, we would have been still successful to this day. This was because of his ego. This was because he could not humble himself and just make a lot of money, you know, and be rich in the background. He wanted to be rich in front of the cameras. Like Dame wanted to gloat, you know, and to look, look at me, look at me, look at me, you know, type of situation. So yeah, Dame Dash is the reason Rockefeller fell under, but let's keep going. From Dame's vantage point, however, the bottom fell out when Jay was dissuaded from the common good by entities that he deems nefarious to the hip hop to this very day among many execs that he ascribes the title of culture vulture. To Dame arraigned then Def Jam president slash puppet master liar Cohen and the combat jack show, it was like they had people that their job is to create beef so they can monetize it. Pause. And they can't make any money or get any respect in their culture. That's why they're in all culture. Because the minute they were allowed to be there, they would go. But they just can't. Never had a beef with Jay. Always with Lior and his whole crew. He's the one thing that ruined Rockefeller. So Lear Cohen is the one who offered Jay-Z the deal, you know, and whatnot at Def Jam. But he didn't have anything to do with Rockefeller going under. That was Dame Dash, once again, a narc not wanting to take accountability. You are the reason that the company fell under. You're taking all of this money out of the company to go on trips and, you know, to bring a bunch of women to sleep with and all buying all, all paying for everything, you know, just to make it seem like you're like a Diddy, you know, if you but Diddy actually has money, you know, to blow and to do things like that. He did not. So he was literally taking the company's investments and using it to party and not taking care of the business deals and a lot of licenses and business things that needed to be taken care of was not being taken care of. That's what made the company fall under. That's why Jay-Z jumped ship. The ship was already sinking. So, I mean, what, what do you mean? I mean, this is Dame, the, the man that says that he don't trust his, you know, basically his artist to do anything for him just to be artist. But then this is the same man that makes the artist vice presidents. 
You know, he doesn't trust his company with the artist. He would never pass the torch to any of his artists. Yet his artists are becoming the, vest, the vice president. Like it, he doesn't make any sense. Like he literally ran that company into the ground. It had nothing to do with Jay-Z. Like stop blaming that on him. That on, Don't blame it on Lior either. Yes, Lior has done a lot of things in our community, in the hip hop community, especially to be frowned upon. But still at the same time, he didn't ruin Rockefeller. Dame Dash did. Known to be an unyielding figure in the boardroom, the frustration that the mogul experienced can be heard in every syllable in the infamous 2003 tirade at Def Jam's office. Aggrieved about Def Jam officials holding meetings about Rockefeller artists without him, Dane pulls no punches, telling the former general manager, Randy Acker, that y'all don't know SHIT about my culture and you do not know SHIT about Jay. Get the F-U-C-K out. Numerous accounts suggest that the matters of the heart also played a pivotal role in their split. In the midst of a lengthy diatribe against Dame, Flex suggested that Dame's wondering eyes is the friction between Hove and Rockefeller's co-owner. Taken to Instagram, Flex teed off on Dame for the violation of the code. His quote, that was J Lady first, dish Flex. Dame did a snake move. Tell me I'm lying, you piece of S-H-I-T. Not the content to stop there. The radio fire ban continued by ambiguously stating that why the rock crumble was you touching Jay-Z's chick. Remember that house in the Hamptons. So this alleged woman is Aaliyah. So according to rumors back in the day, Jay-Z used to date Aaliyah. He dated Aaliyah first. And in the process of them courting one another, Dane Dash ended up shooting his shot with Aaliyah and Aaliyah took the bait. So let's keep going. The original source of Dame's profanity-fueled rant at Def Jam, former Rockefeller producer Choke No Joke, jumped to corroborate Flex's claim, suggesting that he tried to repeat the requisition with Beyonce. I mean, nothing happened like he kissed or sexed her or something like that, Choke said to the Star Report. Did he try to holler at her? Yeah. That's the same thing he did with Aaliyah. Aaliyah fell for it. Yonce wasn't going to violate Jay like that. We all know there was a point at Rockefeller where Dame wasn't allowed around Beyonce. Everybody that worked there at the time knew because he was a creep. So not only did Dame Dash allegedly take Aaliyah from Jay-Z, which there are a lot of pictures of them back in the day. So he was definitely courting Aaliyah at a point in time. Dash came through for the sneak and he definitely took Aaliyah from Jay-Z. So when Jay-Z started dating Beyonce, allegedly Dame Dash did the same thing. He tried to take Beyonce from Jay-Z, but Jay-Z would have been dating Beyonce while Aaliyah was dating Dame. So this is from what I'm gathering um, around th that set time period. Uh, Aaliyah would have been with Dame and Beyonce would have been with Jay. So he would have been trying to cheat on Aaliyah with Beyonce, which is weird because the whole time he was dating Aaliyah, he was with Rachel Roy. So Dame was just a mess, a, a complete and utter total mess. Because he was, he was always with Rachel Roy. Because not too long after Aaliyah passed away, once again, you see Dame and Rachel Roy on the scene again. So it was like they never broke up from what I gather. It was on and off. But he was still with Aaliyah that whole time while trying to get Beyonce from Jay-Z after he already stole Aaliyah. Like crazy, right? Let me know what y'all think in the comments. But moving right along. On the flip side, the release of the revelatory Surviving R. Kelly documentary sparked Dame Dash to make serious claims of his own. Said to have illegally married the singer when she was just 15, the Harlem entrepreneur cited Jay's decision to work with Aaliyah's former partner on the Best of Both Worlds collaborative project as a contributing factor to The Rock's demise. Dame's quote, if you remember the Best of Both Worlds, you don't see my name on it. I never want to know part of that. I know I'm not effing with that. I knew morally we weren't the same. Dash said referring to Jay. So to me, Rockefeller was defunct. It was over. I couldn't F with it. It was something to me I don't want to say unforgivable, but I couldn't understand it. 
Save for an appearance in the Fiesta music video, it would appear on paper that Dame stuck to his word, donating his share of the proceeds to a breast cancer charity that Aaliyah had once championed. But after his claim circulated, Jay's fellow Marcy Project's expat Memphis Bleak refuted Dame's alleged moral repugnance, all the while trying to keep things applicable. His quote, everyone knows that I F with Dame. This is my guy. Rockefeller history, but somebody got to tell him he's bugging, you're bugging. And then you're going to try and say you weren't there with N-I-G-G-A-S's. You was opposed to it. You effing lying. So here's what's going on. Jay-Z and Dame Dash were still cool at this point in time. Jay-Z does an album, Best of Both Worlds, with R. Kelly. Dame Dash makes it seem as if he was not in support of this album is the reason why his name is not on the album, although that's not true. The reason Dame's name is not on the album is because he had nothing to do with the album. There was no reason for him. He's not a producer, you know, or anything like that. So why would your name be on it? Like, what are we talking about? You, um, at that point in time, Rockefeller has sold the majority of the company to um, Def Jam Records. So if anybody's going to be accredited for it, it's going to be more so of Def Jam and Rockefeller just gets a little bit, you know, of credit on the album. So uh, there, there was no reason. And then they brought a whole nother artist into the field, which was R. Kelly. So there's going to be his team and Jay-Z's team and Jay-Z's main team at that point would have been Def Jam. So there was no reason for Dame Dash's name to be credited because once again, he's not an artist. He's not a producer. He's not a writer. He's none of those things. So there was no reason for his name to be on there. That was just him once again being a narc trying to save face. So in my opinion, Dame Dash lied on the Surviving R. Kelly docuseries because he stated that he was not in support of R. Kelly and Jay-Z working together at all. I call bull. And the reason is because why would you be on the Fiesta video shoot at all if you weren't in support? R. Kelly was there. Why would you be there? Like, you're going to be around your sworn enemy due to your girlfriend. This is your girlfriend's alleged predator that you are supporting, you know, within this moment. It just didn't make any sense. So Dame tried to save face once again by wearing a t-shirt in the video sponsoring the cancer foundation that Aaliyah championed behind to try to make it seem as if he was doing it for her. Like, I'm going to do this, but at the same time, I'm looking out for you to make her feel better about the bad decision that Dame knew that he was making. So let, let's not act like Dame, like you're innocent in this situation. You absolutely not. You know, you were wrong for being there in the first place. But here's another thing I'm side eyeing Jay Z. Obviously, if Dame knew what R. Kelly allegedly did to Aaliyah, then I feel like Jay Z knew the same thing. And I find it weird that years later, Jay Z decides to come forward and remove himself from R. Kelly after the trial first happened with him and the 14 year old on the videotape but didn't remove himself in the first place. Jay-Z should have never worked with R. Kelly because he already knew what he needed to know. He allegedly slept with Aaliyah underage when she was a 14, 15 year old girl is when this stuff allegedly started. And he already knew what R. Kelly was capable of. He knew what R. Kelly liked and he knew that R. Kelly was allegedly a predator. So in to insult to injury, one of the same people on the Surviving R. Kelly docuseries is one of the 17 year old women that were at the video shoot. So the Fiesta video shoot where Jay-Z was as well. So I'm side on that, Jay-Z. Why wait until it's a public thing for separation when you should have never worked with him in the first place knowing what he did to Aaliyah? So Memphis Bleak comes forward and states that, you know, look, I, I care for Dame. Dame and I are cool, but Dame, you're bugging. You knew you were in full support of that album being done. You never made it seem as if you had an issue with R. Kelly, you know, or anything like that. Like, bro, stop lying. And that's, you know, why Memphis came forward. Like, yeah, no, that's baloney. So let's keep going. Depending on who you believe, either Jay had Aaliyah first and then Dame came into the picture or vice versa. What we do know is that Jay never speaks on it and Dame constantly does. No one really knows the reason why beyond he is hurt that he and Jay aren't friends anymore. Here is what he had to say to Page Six about the blue yesterday. Dame's quote. He tried very hard, Dash told us of Jay's pursuit of Aaliyah. I did not mean to fall in love with Aaliyah. She was just that cool, he said. But you know, we were both going hard. Everybody was trying to get Aaliyah. It was not just Jay. I did not know Jay was trying to holler at her, but then it just happened like that. 
He was trying. I was trying. Everybody was trying. He was going hard. It is a weird thing to keep talking about it, especially because she is this. So clearly he took Aaliyah from Jay-Z. He knew that Aaliyah and Jay-Z were courting one another. They weren't like in a serious relationship or anything like that, but it was journeying towards that way. Jay-Z was very fond of Aaliyah. He definitely wanted to make Aaliyah like his wife type of situation. And, you know, being around Dame is being around Jay. Being around Jay is being around Dame. So it was easy for Aaliyah to keep seeing him. Um, if you paid attention in the Wendy Williams biop of Aaliyah, the horrible biop that she put together, Dame Dash did meet Aaliyah in the Hamptons. That is the house that F Funk Flex is alluding to. You know, um, remember that house in the Hamptons that Flex said about um, Dame Dash is where, you know, Aaliyah and Jay-Z were hanging out. Dash was there and that's when he kind of came in for the swoop. So Aaliyah didn't like cheat on Jay-Z or anything like that. It was just Jay-Z was courting her and they were more so in the process of about to start dating. When it got to the issue of her hanging out with Dane, he did that deliberately. He knew that Jay-Z had a lot of, you know, affection, you know, for Aaliyah. He really liked her. He really wanted to be with her. And not only him, I'm sure it was a lot of other suitors that were going after Aaliyah. She was a beautiful woman. But, you know, still at the same time, that is a very dirty game to play when, you know, your friend is really interested in someone and you break the code and you come in for the swoop. Everybody knows Dame is a creep. You know, that's why he's not a lot about around Beyonce. You know, when Jay started dating, dating Beyonce. He was like, no, no Dame. Like, he didn't even want Beyonce and Dame in the same room, let alone having a conversation. And I believe that's a precaution for what Dame did with the Aaliyah situation. But, um, yeah, let's keep going. So, speaking of Aaliyah, there's definitely other women that came before Beyonce. So, let's get into some of those women as well. What really happened between Jay-Z and Maya? It's hard to remember a time before Jay-Z and Beyonce were together, but there was. And several other women who were linked to the 99 Problems rapper in that period. Among them is R&B singer Maya, who is known for her songs like Case of the X and her Grammy-nominated album Smooth Jones in 2017. Years ago, there were rumors that they had a relationship after collaborating on the remix of her hit song, Best of Me. At the time, neither Maya or Jay discussed the rumors, which resulted in a lot of ongoing confusion. The two met around 2000 after Maya's label reached out to Jay-Z's team to collaborate on The Best of Me Part 2, a song produced by hip-hop duo and track masters. But they didn't exactly hit it off. Producer Tone, who makes up half of the Trackmasters, told Complex in 2012 interview that Jay-Z was almost immediately turned off by Maya's vibe. His quote, So Jay came into the studio that night at the Hit Factory. He got it right away and he understood what it was, but he didn't like Maya's vibe in the room. He looked at her like she was a spoiled brat because she was. Jay looked at her like, I'm about to rap on your record and you're about to have a hit. And I really don't think you appreciate it, Tone recalled. Annoyed, Jay-Z reportedly left the studio with <laughs> telling the singer, Yo, Maya, Jay wants to do the record but feels like you're not giving him any love. Like, no thank you or none of that. Luckily, though, Jay later came back to finish the song. Jay came in and Maya was more cordial towards Jay, Tone continued. Many insiders claimed that they did, but the rumors in 2014 that Jay had continued to date her and financially support her while married to Beyonce, but the Lady Marmalade singer shut them down. So obviously Jay-Z was pressed that Maya was not giving him a standing ovation when he walked in the room or gave him like the Michael Jackson or, you know, Tina Turner, Whitney Houston type of, you know, entrance when he came in because he was very annoyed at the fact that Maya basically wasn't kissing his feet and jumping up to kiss his hand and, you know, thank him for coming in and being on her track. And he's like, oh, well, you're about to have a hit song. Do you not even realize who you're standing in front of? You know, type of situation. And it's like, well, Jay-Z, you're being paid to do this track, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's not like you're coming in here and doing it for free. And then on top of that, 
drop your verse and leave. Like, I mean, like what, what else is needed here? You know, um, it's not like the video was being shot that day or anything like that. You know, Maya, if she may have seemed spoiled, I mean, it is what it is. I don't feel that way. I feel that Jay felt that, you know, he's just used to other women doing certain things, you know, when he enters the room and Maya didn't feed that. So with her not doing it, he felt some type of way because she was not bowing to him and worshiping, you know, the ground that he walks on. So to him, she's spoiled because she's not appreciative of him as if she's not a hit artist herself. It's like, you're not coming in here to make her career. Her career has already been made. So I really don't get the fact of him, besides him being a narc, about why are you so pressed that she's not standing up clapping like, oh my God, Jay-Z's here. He's just like, okay, hey, um, go in there, drop the track and be on your way. <laughs> Did they begin a relationship after the collaboration? Many insiders claimed that they did. There were even rumors in 2014 that Jay had continued to date Maya and financially support her while Jay was married to Beyonce. But the Lady Marmalade singer quickly shut them down. A fan asked about the rumors on Instagram writing, heard you and Jay-Z had an 11 year affair. Are you his side chick or nah? Maya quickly fired back, stating, never did, never was, never will, she wrote. She continued, I play second to no one, pay my own bills, have my own label, my own management company, rely on God only and respect myself and marriage too much for that nonsense. But sadly, the rumors did not stop there. When Beyonce released her 2016 album Lemonade, where she revealed that Jay-Z had been unfaithful to her, Maya again faced the allegations. But she doubled down on her position telling Vlad TV in a 2016 interview that a relationship between her and Jay-Z never existed. But I did see something that I found very peculiar. So remember in the last video when we were talking about Larry Johnson, um, the man that allegedly Jay-Z had uh, some sort of relationship with because they share an apartment? Well, guess who Larry dated for a while? Yeah, Maya. So with Larry dating Maya, was that like a front with Larry staying at the apartment and having an apartment with Jay-Z so that Larry could hang with Maya, but Maya was really with Jay-Z that whole time? I'm just saying. Allegedly, just in my opinion, was they were they sharing an apartment so that Larry could be the cover for Jay-Z to still see and date Maya? Makes you think, doesn't it? Let me know what you think in the comments. Moving on. There was also speculations that Emile, the rapper, um, when she was under Rockefeller, that she was dating Jay-Z. So let's get into Emile, because she addresses the rumor between her and Jay-Z's romance and reveals why she ditched Rockefeller. So her quote, Emile's quote, Jay had respect for my talent, writing and my voice, nothing more. Jay gave me the opportunity of a lifetime, and what I did with it was my own decision. That was my brother. There was never a relationship between me and Jay or anyone over there. He was like a brother. He was very protective over me. I'm never going to lose any love for Jay. There was never a conversation. He knew that that's not what I wanted to be. I told him I couldn't do it for another year. I think he understood overall. So Emil claims that there was never anything sexual between her and Jay-Z. There was no romantic relationship that Jay-Z was more so like a brother. And Emil also says that she decided to walk away from the game at the point in time because she was just not feeling it. I don't feel that way at all. I feel that Emil walked away for a reason. I feel that Emil was dropped from Rockefeller because there were a lot of rumors circulating about her. But it wasn't just about her and Jay-Z. Beyonce was involved as well. So my question is, is did Jay-Z get rid of Emil because her and Beyonce fell in love with one another or were in a relationship with one another? And why I say that is because if you go to Real 1061 Cleveland at iHeart.com at Real 106.1, there's an article here that states, Rumors of Beyonce having been in a number of relationships with other women have resurfaced. Emile was once signed to Jay-Z's Rockefeller Records. She left the label some time ago, but recently resurfaced in an interview she was supposed to have with a New Jersey DJ back in February, where she reported to have said that her and Beyonce had a romantic relationship and Beyonce had gotten serious. 
Emil says she was really more into men and she didn't feel that way about Beyonce. And on top of that, Emil says she was in a relationship with Killer Priest at the time. She claims that Beyonce had basically fallen for her. Emil claiming to have had a romantic relationship with Beyonce reignited this old rumor. Emil began her career under the wing of Jay-Z. She was the first female artist signed to Rockefeller Records. The internet has not forgotten. I found a number of videos on the subject. Some even go as far as saying Beyonce lives a double life. In questions, her marriage to Jay-Z, whether or not she had a surrogate. I'm intrigued to say the least. What's the big deal? This is Beyonce, man. This video below may have been missed by the masses, but it started to be viewed and shared a lot. Lady Gaga saying in an interview that a project between her and Beyonce worked out because they both like women. Rita Ora was also rumored to have been or is currently in a relationship with Beyonce. Rita has been blamed in the past for being insensitive to lesbian communities because of her song, Girls. So, like I said, this is all alleged. If you go over to Real 106.1, this is an article that they have stating and alleging that Emil used to be in a relationship with Beyonce. And that is technically the reason why Jay-Z had to remove her is because Beyonce had fallen for her. Now, I'm not going to say this is true, but where there's smoke, there's fire. Remember back in the day, the instrumentalist that played in Beyonce's band sued Beyonce and stated that she was also having a three-way relationship with her and Jay-Z? Hmm. Beyonce's former drummer tells Daily Mail TV she's been bullied by the superstar, claiming she put a spell on her cat and ruined her love life by jumping into other bodies to watch her be intimate with partners. Beyonce's former drummer has spoken out about the years of torment she claims she has suffered at the hands of the superstar, alleging Beyonce put a spell on her cat and ruined her love life. She revealed in an exclusive interview with the Daily Mail TV, Kimberly Thompson filed for a restraining order against Beyonce, claiming for the past six years the singer has led a campaign of harassment against her that included the practice of witchcraft and magic spells of sexual M-O-L-E-S-T-A-T-I-O-N. The 37-year-old who was in Beyonce's all-girl band as a drummer for seven years accuses her of being hell-bent on destroying every aspect of her life including career relationships and finances, all out of jealousy. So you can choose to believe her or choose that she's, you know, a little bit off of her rocker. Um, I, I don't know if I believe what she's saying, but still at the same time, stranger things have happened. So um, let me know what you think in the comments. Let me know what you think underneath the video. Do you think that Beyonce has engaged in sexual relationships with women? Do you think that anything ever happened between her and Emil? Do you think anything ever happened between her and Rita Ora? Do you think anything ever happened between Beyonce and this drummer that's claiming that, you know, Beyonce has done sexual things to her allegedly, you know, and what not she has filed a, a legal restraining order on beyonce and a legal lawsuit you know um on beyonce so and she was a part of an all-girl band that beyonce had put together um you know you could look at it as women empowerment or you could look at it as in hey maybe beyonce is fond of women and likes to have a lot of women around her so i mean you be the judge in my opinion the jury is still out we will be coming back with part four uh, thank you all so much for supporting me and watching my video. Remember, everything is all alleged and opinions. This is all public information. Nothing here is being made up. So um, I love you all. Until the next video, I hope you enjoyed. Bye.